Today on Real Talk with Zeb, I have the parents of Sergeant Derek Miller, and today we're going to talk about his case of a premeditated murder where he's currently serving life in Levensworth. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to take it back a little bit. Um, how did Derek get into the uh, services? Uh, after uh, graduating high school, Derek spent some time uh, working with his father-in-law in the construction field. Uh, did uh, go to school. Uh, college for a few semesters and decided that that wasn't for him and uh, fell in love got married and after some deliberation he decided that the best way to both take care of his family and serve his country was to join the Army National Guard and that's exactly what he did I got a phone call from him uh, when it was probably about this time of year it's about an autumn afternoon and and he told me that he decided to enlist and you know my heart took a little jump because this was a this is wartime and no mom wants to hear their only child is going into harm's way in a time of war but I was also proud of him that he decided that it was time for him to step up and do something to defend his country so uh, I, we tried to kind of play the devil's advocate on his enlistment just to make sure that he had thought about it and weighed all of the angles and he told me he says mom I appreciate all of that but I'm calling to let you know I've already made up my mind so you know I prayed over my babe and watched him you know go off into the jaws of war and now his first tour of duty was over in Iraq correct did he talk about that experience um, his first time going to Iraq Derek knows that his mother worries about him so uh, the times that he did tell me about the things that he saw and the things that he did he tried to keep it light but there were there was one incident that he told me um, he actually was awarded a medal for uh, that or made a, some, a military accommodation for um, stopping a armed vehicle that was driving at high speed towards their um, defensive perimeter and uh, he had to fire shots uh, to dissuade the uh, driver from you know uh, pretty much ramming their um, their entry gate and uh, he would he managed to d dissuade that person from doing the evil that they were planning he also um, told me about some times where some IEDs had gone off on the side of the road he'd watch some of his friends get killed and um, you know so he had, he'd seen some pretty um, tough situations but like I said you know a guy's only gonna tell his mom so much because he knows that you know my heart is in my throat knowing the kind of things that I can only imagine that he actually had to live through because um, one of the things I was reading about um with Derek was the time when he came back home and um, some of the things he realized with some of the friends taking their own lives was how how tough was that for him to, to hear stories like that it was it was very difficult because you know after going through that type of combat and being in those life and death situations with someone you develop a close bond I mean those were his brothers he they weren't just um, co-workers or friends I mean he developed some pretty deep friendships with these guys so when they came home and had problems adjusting or even you know basically assimilating what they had lived through it was a devastating blow to Derek every time he heard a story about one of the people that he had come to regard as a brother who is not with us anymore because he just couldn't live with what he had lived had to go through over there it was hard um, in his experiences uh, dealing with that, did did he ever talk about was it difficult for them to get the help needed 
from the military? You know, that's something that I can only guess at. He didn't talk to me so much about their struggles to um, receive treatment. And I know that those programs are available. I, um, all I know is what I saw of how deeply those deaths affected him. So um, I just I thank God every day that he was able to, to deal with what he had to see and what he had to go through. But, you know, I think a, a walk with God is the difference between two people going through the same experience and one being destroyed by it and one rising above it. Now, now as a mother, you realize your son comes home in great health um, from the first tour. When did you hear that he decided to volunteer for the second tour? And what, what was your thoughts? Um... When he came home the first time, I was overjoyed. You know, he was sound of body and all his limbs and faculties intact and um, fit and just focused. It was it was like he he like he had been polished, you know. Um, and I was very very proud. When he told me he was going back, all those feelings that I had the first time came rushing back. But knowing my son the way I do, once he's made up his mind about something, there's really no dissuading him. So I just gave him all of my support and my love and continued to pray for his, his health and well-being because I knew that there was no stopping him. He was part of something bigger than him. Because on the second tour, that's when he really ran into a lot of the dangers with the IEDs yes. and the explosions and really being under heavy fire so during that time he he really saw a lot of the the combat and what well, what kept him from getting the PTSD during that time like I said Derek is a very grounded stable kind of guy it, it's not that he doesn't have any emotions or that he's not affected by what he sees but he has a way of saying, okay, this is my reality. Um, I, I, this, I have this training, and this is the job that I'm here to do. He'll, he was able to get through those times relying on uh, his own work ethic and his own strength of character. And then when he, was, when he came home, he was able to say, okay, that was the job. That job is done. Now I'm home, and he was able to process the transition a little better. Like I said, because I think just because of basically who he is, he's he's really able to um, be very practical and um, down to earth about how he handles things. Now, once he came home from the second time, <laughs> you you pretty much thought that might be it. Uh, no more At tours. Least uh, At least for a while. <laughs> Next thing you know, you hear third tour, this time Afghanistan in a hot zone. Did you did you find out it was going to be a hot zone at the time? Did or? not know at the time where he was going to be sent, but he and I had already spoken quite a few times about how much he loved his military service, his plans to actually become a full-time um, um member of the regular army and he was he had career plans so knowing that that was his aspiration it was it became time for me to adjust to my new reality and know it was kind of like you know having a father who's a firefighter when we were growing up you know that was just daddy's job we didn't realize until we were much older that there were many times daddy might not have come home so Fast forward to me with my grown son who has made up his mind that he wants to make a career in the military. I had to adjust to my new reality and know this is his job. This is something that he loves. He's committed to doing it. And um, I, I always told him growing up that, you know, whatever it is he decided to do, don't have step. Put your whole heart into it, and my job as your mom loving you is to support you in whatever that is. So that's basically where I was on the third deployment. He had thrown his whole heart and soul into military service. He 
was committed to making a career of it. So, as his mom, I gave my love and support to him. And I'm sorry. I just, I'm so proud of him. And it... It was actually the third tour where he became sergeant, it correct? It was. It was. I mean, that was one of the things that... That was one of the things that really made me proud of him is it was no matter what task they gave him, like I said, he put his whole being into doing it to the best of his ability. And if you look at his service record, it, he just excelled at anything that he was given. So when he achieved the rank of sergeant in such a short amount of time, it was just another point of um, pride for me and gratefulness to God that that he has that 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 perseverance and that work ethic that you know so it's almost like any parent you know when just when you think they're not listening to you or just when you think that you know your words have fallen on deaf ears they do something that lets you know they were listening they were paying attention and Derek definitely I'm proud of the man he's become during that time, just to give people a perspective in Afghanistan, this was a, a highly heavy, under fire, hot zone that they were that they were in at the time. Yes. And before we get into what happened that led to him um, going to Levensworth, days prior um, to that incident, they were they were um, under fire, um, from what I was reading in. Uh, in an article. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, they had been engaged in a couple of different um, military operations before that, had gone through some pretty hotly contested areas, had been on 100% security for days on end. I mean, you know, really there was no place for them to be able to let their guard down or relax. So, um, so basically, Derek's um, journey really began the day before his uh, the um, actual incident. Um, as one of his assignments, he was assigned a um, military checkpoint, or like a vehicle checkpoint. His unit at the time, well his, you know, the guys that were assigned to him at the time, were to, tasked with uh, checking vehicles as they went through. Uh, the beyond where he was um, checking vehicles was another hotly contested combat zone. Um, most people were fleeing the fighting. This vehicle came up to the point and was actually headed towards the fighting. Um, the, the occupants of the vehicle were all heavily armed. And one of, the, one of the things that came out during the course of the trial is some intelligence that they had had uh, that in the area, an Afghan National Army unit had been attacked and relieved of weapons, uniforms, IDs. They were to be on the lookout for that kind of contraband. So when that vehicle pulled up, excuse me, pulled up to his checkpoint, that was one of the things that he noticed right away is that they were all heavily armed, that they had IDs that looked like they had been tampered with. Now, he was uniquely qualified to make that determination because in his civilian life, the last job he had before he enlisted was security at Fort Detrick. Okay. So that was his job all day long to check IDs, check credentials, make sure everyone who was um, coming onto the base was authorized to be there. So when he saw these IDs and they looked like they had been tampered with, that was the first red flag. Um, he saw bags of civilian clothing in the vehicle. Now from his previous deployments, he knew that one of the tactics that the enemy would use is they, they would launch an attack and then they would throw what they, what the guys would call man jammies, they would throw these Afghan civilian clothing articles over their uniforms and then they would just vanish into the population. It was impossible to distinguish them from the civilians in the area. So he was suspicious of that when he saw that bag um, or those bags. Um, the other thing that he saw that was suspicious 
were empty 55 gallon drums and he knew from his time in um, Iraq that that's what they used to make the IEDs so while he's um, inspecting the personnel and the contents of the truck one of the gentlemen one of the soldiers under his uh, command was patting down the driver at close range I mean you know intimately um, observing this man so Derek goes to his superior officers and, say, and, and tells them his concerns about this vehicle they had um, instructions from higher up in the, in the chain of command that if the serial numbers on the IDs match the serial numbers on the weapons that they were to let the vehicles pass so in spite of all of his misgivings about this truck they um, they let they allowed them to pass through the checkpoint so when you fast forward to the day of the incident they had finally reached an area where they could establish a security perimeter and stand down to 50 percent security so that they could rest a bit and get something to eat so after they had already set up this uh, perimeter Derek is eating chow having chow with his uh, with his men and the, the very person who patted down that driver the day before gets Derek's attention and says hey there's the guy from the truck at the checkpoint the previous day he looks and, and you know the the soldier has positively identified the driver of the truck full of armed men he was with two other military aged men um, my understanding is that he, you know those guys were sent off and they went in different directions but Derek questioned the one who was actually identified as the driver asked him, what are you doing here? You're inside, inside our fob. What are you doing? He says, I'm here to do some electrical work to fix it down line. And Derek is like, well, where are your tools? You have no tools. How are you going to fix anything? So then he changes the story. Oh, I'm here to fix a water pump. He still didn't have any tools. So Derek is like, look, man, you're in a secure area. You're not authorized to be here. You need to leave. And as the guy's leaving, Derek is, you know, is just still very uneasy about the question line of questioning, the fact that he was there, the fact that he was with other men. So he goes to his secure, his uh, superior officer, and asks for permission to question the guy again because he just doesn't feel like he got the full story. He gets permission. On his way to get the, to, you know, get bring the the guy back. He asks one of the other soldiers for a weapon because, you know, he's in a hot combat zone. His weapon is locked in his vehicle as his procedure when they're having chow. So, but he knew by the time he went back to his vehicle to get his weapon, he that guy would have been gone. So he gets a weapon. He goes and gets the guy back. He takes two people with him. One is the soldier he got the weapon from. That, that soldier provided overwatch to make sure that, you know, there was no attacks or anything while Derek was questioning the guy. The second person was an Afghan interpreter that was assigned to their unit who was trans supposed to be translating the questions. So he gets the guy, brings him back to the middle of the fob at the, ba at the base of the steps of a building and starts questioning him. And in the course of the questioning, gets kind of heated. I presumably because the guy knows that he was caught and uh, and he goes for Derek's gun Derek fires to defend himself and the guy ends up dying of his wounds his name was Atta Mohammed um, one of the things that was not allowed to be mentioned at the trial but um, you know he he when he fired his gun his unit went back to 100% alert, 100% security, and moved out of the positions that they had been at when they were having chow and, um, and resting. Shortly after that incident, after the gun went off, Derek pulls the body into the building where they were, um, where the questioning happened to get it out of the sight of some of the younger soldiers. He didn't want anybody who hadn't really seen any hard combat to you know, be adversely affected. So he, he took the body out of the line of sight and 
not too long after that, they were attacked on all four sides. And it, the, the nature of the attack was, it was concentrated, it was targeted at the positions, the exact positions where the men were eating, where their weapons were stored, where the vehicles were parked. Because they had intelligence, the people who were launching the attack had intelligence on all of the particulars inside of that defensive perimeter. The man that Derek ended up killing and those two men that he was with, that's what they were doing. They were reconnoitering that position. Um, and there were guys who, he, who served with him that day who came to testify to the fact that there was no way that that type of an attack could have been launched without detailed intelligence. Um, and they also came to testify that he saved their lives that day because of what he did. No that, American lives were lost that none. day. Yeah, I was reading about that. No, no soldier life was lost that day because they were put on high alert. Exactly. Derek was right about, you know, but the actions that he took were, were correct and necessary. Um, the One of the things that, um, that we have been trying in vain to get the Army to acknowledge is even if they felt that they had to prosecute Derek, which we wholeheartedly disagree with. When you look at similar cases, because Derek's not the only one, he's not the first and he hasn't been the last, his sentence is completely out of line with any other case in similar circumstances. Because it's actually like, a, the, uh, I was reading, the Leavensworth 10? Leavenworth 10. That those soldiers preceded Derek into Leavenworth confinement, also for actions that they took in field of combat, some of them far more egregious than what Derek um, experienced. And a lot of those, I, I, can, I can say all of them, have lesser sentences than Derek. Some of them have had uh, multiple reductions in their sentences. Uh, there are several of them that are out, out, out on parole. Now. They're they're breathing the free air right now, and Derek is sitting, you know, on a life sentence with no relief. He has to serve ten years before he can even be eligible for a parole hearing. And you know, every day that goes by is a day that he can't get back with his family. I mean, if we can send Guantanamo de, uh, de detainees home. Guys who are documented terrorists, people who have already attacked us, who have come back to fight us again, we can let them go home. I was because you know I was going to ask you about that because you know I think prior to Derek's incident, um, during that time, um, five uh, Taliban insurgents were released for the one. Bo uh, Bergdahl. Yes. Bo Bergdahl. That, when I saw that story, all I could sit, do is sit there in stunned disbelief because here we have a, a man who subsequently, after the, all the facts came out, turned out he was a deserter. A deserter. He was a deserter. He was a traitor to his country. And we traded five of the worst of the worst mm -hmm. Taliban uh, detainees. We had them in custody. They were off, out, out, out from amongst us, unable to affect any more damage to us. And we let those men go to bring Bo Bergdahl home. And Derek, who followed every rule that he was supposed to follow, did what he felt he had to do to defend himself and his men, is sitting in Leavenworth. I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I have no idea how, in what universe that makes any sense. The whole point of the Article 32 was to determine whether there was enough evidence, evidence to, to proceed. The two main witnesses for the prosecution, one of them didn't even want to be involved. The second one was not even physically present. And the only reason that he changed his story was, well, let me back up a little bit because 
when the investigation first started, one of the first things that they did is they had each one of the men involved write a detailed statement. And each of their statements were completely in, in sync. You know, that there was a struggle for the gun, the gun went off, Derek fired in self-defense. The CID came in and basically told Specialist Miller that if he didn't change his story, he was going to be charged as an accessory to murder. Pretty much strong-armed him into changing his story, told him he had to take the word struggle out of his um, statement, and that was the only way that he was going to be able to go to home to his fiance and get married. Otherwise, he was going to be detained. So Specialist Miller did what he had to do to get back to his life. And he changed his testimony against my son. But before that, I mean, there was no question about the series of events. And Derek's um, recount of the events has not changed in the entire course of this of this ordeal. He has never wavered from his story because it is the truth. Um, and, and one of the things, um, not not to cut no, you off, ahead, one please. of the things that was, that was talked about was not able to get any evidence for the case. There was not a shred of physical evidence, no forensic. Um, examination of the scene, no autopsy of the body. There was nothing, the, the pictures, that they even the pictures that they presented at trial were of the building after it had been scrubbed down, cleaned, and whitewashed. It could have been anywhere in Afghanistan. And the thing that is mind-boggling about this is that in a military court of law, these things are perfectly acceptable. In a civilian court, where you and I would find ourselves if we were faced with the same set of circumstances, this case would have been thrown out for lack of evidence. The witnesses, when you look at the how many times the testimony was changed by their two main witnesses, that would have been something that would have gotten this this uh, these charges dropped and this case thrown out. But in a military court of law, all of those things are acceptable. Hearsay testimony. I mean, he, he had a, a panel of, t of 10 people, excuse me, he had a panel of 10 people that were going to decide his fate. Only two of them had ever seen a day of combat. They didn't even have to have a unanimous decision to convict him. And they only needed 7 out of 10 to convict. That's what they got. So you send a man away for life who has never had any trouble with the law, and has no criminal record, not even a history of violent tendencies or anything like that. Sterling service record, admired by his peers and his superiors, and you send him away for life, for premeditated murder, for actions that he took in a combat zone with no evidence whatsoever. And this is supposed to be America. <laughs> you know, it. You know, reading the story, it truly reminded me of a movie that I saw called uh, Rules of Engagement with uh, Samuel Jackson. How I remember that movie. He, he would be the movie buff. I, <laughs> I remember that. It, in that, they were under heavy combat, and what had happened, they were getting fired upon by the locals, uh, women and men, women and children. So in the heavy fire, he commanded his troops to fire back. There was a tape of that, but the government wound up destroying the tape because they wanted to keep diplomacy in the region. And it just reminded me of that, like, he, he was never able to get any evidence from that. And that's one of and, the And things. it kind of takes me to, you know, uh, you know, reading about the right now with the strict rules of engagement that were put in place back in 2009, 2010. Um, it's been an increase in death of soldiers. Yes. Like, how, how, how is that possible? It's like they're not protecting their own. They're and, afraid and, they end up where Derek is. They, they, men and, and men who are in a combat situation have to make a life and death decision are second guessing themselves and hesitating because they know that if they make uh, a tough decision they're not the, the, the military is not going to have their back if it serves a, high, a, a purpose that they have no idea what it is for them to be left high and dry or thrown under the bus 
that, that our government will do that to them. Our, our military will do that to them. And they're afraid. They're afraid to end up where Derek is. Is the morale low right now? Um, understandably so. But I can't speak for every military service person. And, and this is Derek's experience. It's not everyone's experience. But even one case like this is too many. Even one, I, I, I know that for a lot of decision makers, and decision makers and policy makers and politicians, that it's a game of statistics and numbers for them. You know, a certain percentage of these in, incorrect prosecutions are acceptable. But every single one of those is a life that is destroyed. My son has lost everything but his life in this situation, his marriage, his children, his parents, his his career. He's lost everything because somebody, I mean, during the course of the, uh, the trial, the commander of the operation had to get up on the stand and testify. He started to talk about how he had to meet with the local government, Afghan National Army, and certain officials to come up with a so-called mitigation plan. As soon as he started talking about that, the prosecution could not hustle him off the stand fast enough. They had all of that stricken from the record, but it is burned into my memory because as soon as he said that, it clicked for me. They, they had to come up with some kind of peace offering or some kind of agreement to, to, keep, keep, diplomacy. That, to <laughs> keep that situation from boiling over so they had to promise that somebody was going to be punished and that somebody was my son. And bear in mind that he was a, he was a witness for the prosecution. Wow. Yeah. Now, in the process of trying to get Derek out, you've reached out to your congressman, um, have you reached out to like Chris Van Hollen? Um, yes, we're in his district. So we have reached out to his office with very disappointing results. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been very difficult for us to rally our Maryland representatives to, um, to advocate for Derek. I mean, at this point, I mean, his complete, his trial is finished. All his appeals are done. We have no recourse left in the military courts. We can't even go to the Supreme Court because once the CAF court, which is the highest military court, makes their decision on whether or not a case can proceed and they've t they, they denied any kind of appeal for Derek, the case is dead as far as the military is concerned. So the only recourse we have now is to reach out to our elected officials, our representatives, to advocate for some kind of clemency and, or mercy for Derek. And it, it, if Derek fought for them the same way he, that they're fighting, they're fighting for him, which is non-existent, then we would all be in trouble because Derek didn't hesitate or pull his punches when it was time to make a tough decision. But it just seems like every Maryland delegate that we sat down with. How frustrating is that? It's, it's, it's immensely frustrating because here we have a man who lived in their, in their districts, worked, contributed, paid his taxes, voted, you know, faithfully voted. And, and now here he is. He's in a situation where he needs them to advocate for him. And we can't get any, we got from Chris Van Hollen a letter, very half-hearted letter to the Secretary of the Army that never even really got to him. It was answered by a low-ranking someone in his office asking for them to maybe perhaps think about looking at giving him some kind of a clemency hearing or something. I mean, it was very, very um, timid letter. And the, the response that he got from them is that we have the um, option to appeal the case in the military courts. Now, when we sat down with Mr. Van Hollen, I had a face-to-face. -face. I was sitting no farther away from him than I am from you right now. And I poured my heart out to him. I told him that we had exhausted every avenue within the military courts. 
they wrote him that letter back and told him that we could appeal his decision. And his response to us was, oh, well, I'm so sorry. That's all we can do. Um, have a nice day. I'm really sorry for what happened to your son. I'm like, wait a minute. That was his opportunity to come back and say, wait, you know, this family has already exhausted that avenue. You know, what can be done to, you know, bring his case in line or to, to offer him some kind of relief to, as, as other similar cases have received? I mean, he had any other number of responses that he could have made, but we, we, he decided that he did all he was willing to do and there's nothing in it for him. I mean, as far as he's concerned, I feel like as soon as we walked out of that conference room door, it was like we were never there. It, we have nothing to offer him. As far as he's concerned, we're a family of nobodies that have nothing to offer him. But we did offer our support. We offered our tax dollars. We offered our, our, um, our lives, basically. We offered, we, we've done that. That's how he is where he is. People like us who work hard, pay taxes, and vote. That's why he is where he is. I, 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 I was deeply, deeply disappointed with that's, the That's correct, because his job is to work for the citizens of Maryland and, and to be our representative. Exactly. I mean, who else are we supposed to turn to in times like this? So, I mean, but, it was, but he wasn't the only one. He was supposed to be the lead. But he wasn't the only one we went to. We went to Donna Edwards' office. Oh, wow. See, I, yeah, we I didn't know that. We went to Donna Edwards' office. I don't even think we got her chief of staff, Mr. Chris Schlosser, who made all kinds of assurances of assistance, and uh, even on a personal level, because his family has a history of service in the same unit as Derek. Wow. We couldn't even get a call back or a return email or anything from him. So, you know, once again... You sit there, you pour your heart out, you give. I had a packet of information about his service record, some excerpts from the trial record. I offered the full trial record for anybody who wanted to see it. And we get a, a mouthful of assurances and no action. We went, went to John Delaney's office. He didn't even deign to give us his chief of staff. We got to talk to an intern in his office absolutely nothing from his office and all every single time we sat down with any of them what we heard was congressional courtesy where they they advised us go to our representative first give him the opportunity to assist before they would actually take action and get involved we've done that and with absolutely completely ineffective so now we're reaching out to others. Did um, you reach out to the Congressional Black Caucus to see did. what they could do? We did reach out. We reached out to, actually reached out to um, Elijah Cummings' office. And they have been, you know, of the most help that we've received thus far. Um, we got a letter of support from them signed by Mr. Butterfield, who is the president and Mr. Cummings, who we are, you know, very grateful for that assistance. However, once again, it was a situation where the letter was asking for a clemency hearing. It was directed to the acting secretary of the Army at the time, and um, which was kind of odd because, you know, the current secretary of the Army had already been appointed. I, But it's still, I mean, we still haven't even gotten a response. I mean, here we are, we got... You know, two powerful members of Congress who have written a letter in support of my son, and we haven't gotten a response. So, um, you know, like I said, we had a rally for Derek a week ago and had quite a bit of interest from um, congressmen on the other side of the aisle. Yeah, that's that's interesting because this is actually, I'm glad we got to this to this point because this is actually how I heard about the story of, of Derek. Um about you going to the steps of Congress and actually a friend of mine, PFK Boom, actually I saw the interview um, with Derek's father um, and that's how I researched more about the story and it, and, and it really bothered me that you would be on the steps of Congress and the congressman would pass you by 
Not With even a, a gigantic kid. picture of Derek holding his infant daughter. Would not even take a business. Would not even acknowledge the fact that you were there. That that bothered me. And and like you said, um, I think there were six on the other side of the of the aisle that actually they stopped came and to stopped, listen. Asked questions, took information. Um, they, I mean, the the response was very. Um, very encouraging from the from the the yes. senator the congressman who stopped to talk to us i mean actually took the time later on that week because we were there for three days on the third day we got a mag, uh gully washer of a storm i mean it was it was not fit for man or beast outside so we took the fight indoors and we met with several congressional offices we hit every member of the um armed services committee um and, and many of them graciously sat down with us uh, without any appointments. Some of them we did have appointments for. Many of them were not with, without any appointments. We talked to the military liaisons. We talked. Several congressmen actually sat in on our meetings and asked very probing questions. And um, actually, some, a couple of have already taken follow-up action to see what they can do to help. And this is the response that we were looking for from our own representatives. What, what were their opinions about it once they heard about Derek's story? Outrage. Outrage and, and disbelief. Um, they know that this is not the way our, um, our, our servicemen need to be treated. They, they understand the, um, the, the inequity that's going on here. And they also realize the glaring contrast between the fact that Derek is still being held while the Guantanamo Bay detainees get to go home. This is something that doesn't sit well with them at all. And, you know, so it's just yet another reason for them to step up and help. So we're very encouraged so far by the response. But, you know, we've been fighting this fight for six years. And the the proof is going to be the follow through. So we're just waiting to see. We're 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 grateful for anything that they would do to help us, um, because Derek deserves it. He he did what he was supposed to do. It's now, time for them to do what they're supposed to do. Now I got I, I got I got to ask this because you know yesterday in USA Today uh, there was an article with uh, President Obama. Um, being the president who's released uh, most, as far as um, giving clemency under his under his watch, uh, more than eleven presidents combined. I think one hundred thirty-two yesterday. Were you able to get to him to talk about Derek's case? We have a packet on in front of him right now. Not just Derek, but several others. It, our understanding is that it's on his desk, and we all, we ask if we can show mercy to so many others, so many others who actually did something wrong. And, and I also want to take a moment right here to, to, to say that the loss of life is deplorable. We don't condone the killing. We don't condone. War is ugly. People die in war. There are decisions if you could take them back, you, you would. Derek is not in that position. He was not one given to, you know, flightiness or was skittish under fire or anything like that. If you read all the accounts of him, he was cool-headed. That, that's why I read earlier yeah, that statement. Yeah, cool-headed, calm, self-possessed. He, he, Derek, he relied on his training and did what he was sent there to do. If we can show mercy to so many others, then President Obama, I just ask you, to show mercy to my son. He deserves to come home to his family too. He, I think he has sacrificed enough. And it's time for my son to come home. 
how how hopeful are you with those with those efforts knowing there's what three months left in the White House I believe my hope is in God God I don't know what's going to happen in these not in these last few months of his presidency I don't know what's going to happen in the election to come but I know that my God is faithful all we can do is walk the path he's going to be the one to, to change hearts so anybody who is watching this who is in a position to make this right we ask as a little family of nobodies with a son with a lion's heart please make this right send him home to his family they love him and they miss him too and we do Can I, speaking of faith how has this tested your faith in this process or make it stronger in your beliefs it definitely definitely has made our faith stronger this has been a hellish nightmare from the day that that sentence was handed down it was like someone reached in and ripped my heart out from me we have been I feel like we've been through the rabbit hole we have not nothing about this makes any sense but one thing that we have had is constant reaffirmations that God is in control there have been people that have never even met us who have reached out to us from across the ocean to show kindness and support. We have seen people who probably would, wouldn't even know us to walk, uh, walk past us on the street who have reached into their hearts, their pockets to send us to see him, of given of their time and their resources to help try to get the word out. And I mean, even on the way home, I can tell you a story about our, our trip home after Derek's conviction. We had planned on you know, having him with us. We were going to stop along the way. We had some things. We were going to celebrate him coming home. And here we are with this great big hole where Derek used to be. We we're coming home in our vehicle, faithful but a little long in the tooth finally decided to give up the ghost. Grayson, Kentucky. We were in a little tiny town we had never even heard of with a vehicle that didn't work and nowhere to go. And time after time on that visit, the hotel that, that took us in <clears throat> charged us next to nothing to be there. The restaurant we, we had to walk to to try to get something to eat wouldn't take a penny for any food that we had that day. The person who fixed our truck wouldn't take a dime, wouldn't take a dime when he heard what had happened to us. After he fixed our vehicle, we, we, we went home without any, any more trouble but with, in complete awe of God's hand on the situation. We know that we know that we know that he is He's, he's got our family in his hands. He's got our son in his hands. And, and it's just, I don't know how people get through times like this without a walk with God. I think, I think it's the difference between two people going through a similar um, experience and one person being destroyed by it and another person rising to the, rising to the challenge because anything good or strong anybody sees in me or and Derek will tell you too is straight from God and we're we're trusting him to help us get through this he's the kind of person that will reach out to someone else when he sees them struggling emotionally or feeling isolated he'll counsel them he'll pray with them he'll Bible study with them he his Faith is what has kept him always hopeful, even in the midst of what seems to be a hopeless situation. Derek is the kind of person who
who knows that one day somebody's going to come through the door of that cell and say, it's time for you to come home. And he holds on to that hope, knowing that the people who love him are not going to let this stand. So, Does he feel right now he's having a, a Job experience? Pretty much, pretty much. A Job, uh, a Joseph a jo situation. Yeah, that's right, Joseph. I that's mean, he, he, was, he was betrayed by his brothers. Not the ones he fought with, but the ones he reported to. Not the ones that were in the trenches with him, but the ones who were supposed to be watching out for him. And, uh, you know, we know how those stories ended. Does he have any bitterness right now about Amazingly, being no. Real? Okay. Amazingly, no. As a matter of fact, if you told Derek, if, one, if Derek got out tomorrow and his country needed him, you know he would deploy again? That's what he told me. Did he, that blow you away? It or? did blow me away. It, it blew me away to hear him say that his commitment to finish what he started is that strong. That he's not going to, he's not going to let. So that's, some, that's how much love he had for his brothers on the front line. Exactly. He looks at where he is now as just another deployment. Another mission. Another mission. You know, and, and like I said, he sacrificed, he sacrificed willingly to go over there three times when he had a, 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 a two young babies and a wife who needed him at home. He sacrificed to do that. And he's, and he's sacrificing now to be away from them, knowing that his actions saved the people that he served with. You know, I'm, I'm going to ask you this then, because he's probably heard what's going on in the country right now with the protests of the National Anthem. What is his thoughts about that, and what are your thoughts about that, knowing that what you heard about your son saying, if he was out tomorrow, he would be right back out there with his brothers on that front line. You know, that's something that we have not had an opportunity to talk about. I can't call him. He has to call me. And he, you know, he has his duties and he has his schedule there. And, and everything is very, very tight. So we only get to talk for 30 minutes at a time. And that happens twice a week. So when we talk, we talk about family, and family, future, faith. Those are the things we talk about. I, I relish the time when I can sit down and, and talk to Derek about how he feels about the direction that this country has taken and, and how his views on the things that he fought for and the things that he would willing to, willingly fight for again. Because there, he fights for that flag. He, do, he, he does. And he fights for you and, and me, me and his father and anyone to be able to walk exactly. into a courtroom and know that they will face a jury of their peers, that, they ha that the prosecution has the burden of proof, that, that, they have, that sufficient evidence has to be presented, that, that you know, those are things that we expect that he went and fought for, could have died for, that were not present for him when he needed them because the military courts are upside down and backwards. I, I relish being able to talk to him about all those things. He's a very intelligent man. He's very insightful and one of the things, the great debater that he's always been called is, I, I, I look forward to those times when I can talk to him about those things, but we haven't had the opportunity. For myself, I, li I like to say I'm a faithful person, so I want to talk life into it. What does he want to do once he's released? He wants to come home and work. He wants to be a, the provider and, and protector for his daughters that he has not been able to be. He, he has dreams. He, he wants to accomplish things. He, he also wants to make sure that this doesn't happen to anybody else. You know, there needs to be a review and an overhaul, I mean, and a real, genuine overhaul of our military courts. Who knows if that's going to happen in our lifetime, but Derek would definitely be 
down for um, being a part of that kind of change. You know, that's interesting because you said currently right now he's uh, doing classes, college classes while he's there. Yes. What is he actually studying and while he's there? Business administration. That's one of the, the, the choice of majors is very limited. So he, he picked one that he can springboard into other things. Um, he also expressed an interest in uh, occupational safety. I mean, he, he wants to make sure that working conditions are safe for um, people who are working in dangerous conditions like oil rigs and things like that. I mean, there's so many things that he cares deeply about that he was, it, it wants to be able to, to explore and examine and, and give his time and his talent to when he comes home. Uh, and I'm living for the day that he gets that chance. Uh, I want to say I really appreciate your time today. And, you know, inviting me into your home to tell your story, and I just truly pray that it, it gets out to the masses that you'll be able to come home soon. And what would you like to say to the other mothers out there who are actually going through the same thing that you're going through? That my heart and my prayers are with you. I know that this is a difficult road. Don't give up. You're their only voice. Do everything that you can to be their voice and be their advocate. And God will strengthen you uh, as he has strengthened me. And Because I'm not going to lie and say that this has been easy. There have been days when the enormity of it is enough to crush me. And then I think about my son's clear eyes and complete faith the day they took him away and I told him that as long as there's a breath in my body I will continue to fight for him and he looked at me without a shadow of a doubt in his mind and he said I know mom and so for the other moms that are in the same situation your your babies they 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 trust you and that trust is well placed God is going to strengthen you and I I look to celebrate with you when your sons come home, too. Thank you for your time today, and God bless you both. Thank, Thank you, you so God much. God bless for Derek. Us.